So we are here in the first week of Advent. It's a season of waiting where we remember how the, the ancient people of Israel, they were waiting on the promised Messiah. And so we, we look at some of the prophecies that foretold the coming of Jesus, the baby in the manger. And we use some of their experience to give us courage as we look forward to the return of Jesus, the coming king. But I don't know about you, but I really don't like waiting very much. Do you like waiting? You like trip to the DMV? Awesome. No? Or even, even like, uh, like, you know, the checkouts, you know, in, the, in any of the stores right now, the lines get really long. If, if not, if you're like me, you're always looking for the shortest line. You're kind of scanning in advance at Costco. Okay, where's the shortest line? And if you're like me, if you get into the shortest line, that's a pretty much sure sign that somebody up in front, they're going to need to get carded for something. They're going to start writing checks. I mean, something's going on that's going to, it's going to slow down the process, right? I hate waiting. And yet waiting is such a significant part of what it means to be walking with the Lord. Um, it's just a significant part of the Christian, Christian life. I mean, Jesus said, behold, I am coming soon. You think of all the times he said that in the New Testament to his disciples. Jesus. <laughs> it's, you've been taking your sweet time, Lord. So we, we're trying to figure out, like, what does it mean to live in the midst of waiting? So what I want to do these the next couple of weeks as part of our Advent series is to look at, take a closer look at some of the prophecies of Jesus' coming. Now, today we're going to look at one that's one of the best known. This is a pretty famous prophecy. It's the reason why um, the word Emmanuel is such a big deal at Christmas. It's because of this pr prophecy in Isaiah 7. Um, now, so if you have your Bibles, your paper Bibles or your Bible apps or whatever, turn to Isaiah chapter 7. See if you can find it. And while we're going there, um, I want us to take a quick look in Matthew chapter 1. We'll put that up on the screen. Because this is the part of the story that you are, you've probably already heard. Even if you're not like a church person, um, you've probably heard this part of the Christmas story. And you've probably heard this prophecy at some point in your life. But what you've probably never heard is the story behind the prophecy. That's where we're going to go today, okay? So start us, start us off in Matthew chapter 1. Here's the part of the story that you already know. This is how the birth of Jesus the Messiah came about, Matthew writes. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph, but before they came together, she was found to be pregnant through the Holy Spirit. Because Joseph, her husband, was faithful to the law and yet did not want to expose her to public disgrace because he knows how biology works. And she knows how biology works, and this is not the way it's supposed to work. So Joseph has questions. He, he had in mind to divorce her quietly. He tries to figure out what is the way to get out of this situation with the least possible negative consequences. Because he loves Mary even though he doesn't trust her at this point. He's trying to figure that out. But after he'd considered all this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and he said this, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son and you are to give him the name Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. Now here's we get to that prophecy. You've probably heard this one before. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. You, you've heard that one before, that, that prophecy. So this is one of the, the, the big prophecies of the Old Testament that's fulfilled in Jesus. A virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, and he will be God with us. And, and that it certainly is one of many one of hundreds of prophecies that are fulfilled in Jesus. But the story behind the prophecy is uh, it's kind of interesting. So for us to go there, we're going we're gonna to find, find Isaiah chapter 7 in our Bibles, and we're going to, to transport back 700 years prior to this moment to the story of King Ahaz. 
King Ahaz. Now, King Ahaz was one of the kings of Judah, and he was arguably one of the worst kings of Judah. If there's a top 10 list of worst kings of Judah, he's somewhere near the top. The picture that's depicted on the screen, this is how he's often known because King Ahaz, he had, um, his faith had been so corrupted he had been so influenced by the surrounding nations that he gave in to some of the worship practices of the surrounding nations, including sacrificing some of his own children to the Assyrian gods. So he, he's taking his own kids, throwing them in a fire to worship Assyrian gods in an effort to secure the security of the nation of Israel. I mean, that is horrible, horrible, horrible. You can hardly imagine a more wicked act that's King Ahaz. And yet, where he ended up in this horrible place happened in part because of the defining moment that we're about to, to um, learn more about here in Isaiah chapter 7, where, where Isaiah, where, hang on, King Ahaz was given a choice, and he chose wrongly. And that choice has everything to do with the prophecy that would later be, for, that would later be fulfilled in Jesus. Now, before we jump into the prophecy, there's a couple of things you need to know about biblical prophecy. Now, and this will maybe help you understand some of the prophecies in the Bible, and it may also annoy you just a little bit. I'm going to tackle, tack, tackle both parts of that. See, with biblical prophecy, it generally has these two elements simultaneously. You've got the element of the prophecy that you could refer to as near, that something is going to be fulfilled very, very soon. And you have the part of the prophecy that is far, that's distant, that won't be fulfilled for a very long time. And in the prophecy itself, they're kind of all jumbled together, a little bit like this image on the screen. The near and far are mixed in together. Or if we could, we could take the near and far and do a side view of it, let's try that, using high-tech Graphics. Here we go. You are the skinny little dude with the big head. Okay, imagine that. So from your perspective, there is part of the prophecy that is imminent, that's near. It's going to happen very soon. But there's also part of the prophecy, and you don't know which part of the prophecy it is necessarily in the moment, that is distant, that's far. And because the near one is closer, you actually see it pretty large. And the distant one may not even seem as big. But um, God's word is so powerful that as it resonates through history, its long-term fulfillment is very often much, much, much greater than its short-term fulfillment. It's a little bit like a tsunami on an ocean. So imagine you and I, we are sitting in the middle of the Pacific Ocean in a rowboat. Hi. Hi. Wouldn't that just stink? <laughs> so we're right in the middle of the Pacific Ocean, rowing along. It's, oh, it's only about 4,000 miles to land. Don't be worried. Okay, we're, we're, but we're sitting in the, in the middle of the Pacific Ocean in a rowboat, and an earthquake happens under the ocean, under miles and miles and miles of water. From the surface, we'd feel something like this. Just turn to your neighbor and go. All right. Just a little bump, a couple of feet up in the air. Wow. I wonder what that was. It was a massive honking earthquake way under the water. But on the surface, close upward, we only experience a little bit. We experience something, but it's just a little bit. But that same shock wave, as it spreads out across the ocean, when it comes into the shallower water by the coastline, that little two-foot rise that you felt in the middle of the ocean could be a 20-foot, 30-foot, 40-foot wave cresting on a shore somewhere. God's word is like that. There's going to be fulfillment in the, in the imminent, in the short term, and there's going to be even greater fulfillment over time. And the problem is, when you're first hearing the prophecy, let's go to the next, next slide, please. The imminent and the distant, are, they're, they're mixed up. They're all jumbled together, and you don't necessarily know which part is which other than God's word is always going to be true. Now, we're going to see this principle illustrated as we head into the story of King Ahaz. So I'll take off my teacher hat, kind of put on my preacher hat again or something, and, and let's, let's dive into the story, okay? 
So King Ahaz, we're picking it up in, in Isaiah chapter 7, verse 1. When Ahaz, son of Jotham, the son of, son of Uzziah, was king of Judah, king Rezin of Aram, and Pekah, son, uh, son of Ramallah, king of Israel, marched up to fight against Jerusalem, but they could not overpower it. That's the summary of the story. Now we're going to go into the details, starting with verse 2. Now the house of David, that's Judah, same thing as the, as the nation of Judah, was told, Aram has allied itself with Ephraim, which is the same thing as the nation of Israel, okay? So the hearts of Ahaz and his people were shaken as the trees of the forest are shaken by the wind. Let me give you a little backstory there, okay? So um, by this point in the history of the nation of Israel, the nation is divided. There is a northern kingdom known shorthand as Israel, and there's the southern kingdom, smaller but the southern kingdom known as Judah. And now, when God gave his people the land to the, the, all the 12 tribe, tribes, they were supposed to be the 12 united tribes of Israel. But over time, because of corruption and power struggles and all this kind of stuff, the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom became two separate countries. So if you want to put this into a modern kind of geopolitical politics, you could imagine all of the northern states of the United States being its own country and Texas being a, an entirely different country. Texas gets so angry with all the weird stuff that the northerners are doing, they decide to become this entirely separate nation. So you've got Texas and all of the states that aren't Texas. That makes sense? Okay, northern kingdom, southern kingdom. But here's the part of the story that's absolutely scandalous, is the northern kingdom, all the states that aren't Texas, have formed an alliance with a country that has nothing to do with the values of Israel. I mean, a, a, a country that's just diabolically opposed to, the, to, the, to everything that Israel stands for. That's the country of Aram. So it's a little bit like um, the king of Texas... In this case, that's going to be King Ahaz. The king of Texas gets news that all of the northern states, the northern kingdom, has, gone, um, has formed an alliance with Russia to destroy Texas. Can you imagine? That's really, really screwed up. But that's the situation that King Ahaz finds himself in. There's, there's a massive, massive army that's conspiring to destroy him and destroy his country. Okay. Then we get to verse 3. Then the Lord said to Isaiah, Go out, you and your son, Shir Jezeb, to meet Ahaz at the end of the aqueduct of the upper road, or upper pool, rather, on the road to the launderer's field. Quick pause. One of the things I love about God's Word, and especially these funny little details in it, is it reminds us that these are stories of very real people in very real places. Now, there are parts of the Bible that are meant to be understood figuratively, like the parables, things like that. They're true, but they're stories that help us to illustrate, help us to understand God's, God's word and God's truth better. And there's other parts of the Bible that are just absolutely literal. So as we hear this part of the story, I want you to imagine, here's a stressed out king. He's pacing around Jerusalem, because he's heard the rumor that the country that should have been somewhat of an ally to the north has formed an alliance with this horrible other country to destroy him and his country. And that a massive army is being formed against him. So he's pacing around Jerusalem. He's in a bind. He has no idea what to do. And as his king is pacing back and forth, a prophet comes, walks up to meet him with his little boy. And God gives this instruction to Isaiah. Say to him, be careful, Ahaz. Keep calm and don't be afraid. Do not lose heart because of those two smoldering stubs of firewood, because of the fierce anger of Rezin and Aram and of the son of Ramallah. Aaron, Ephraim, and Ramallah's son have plotted your ruin, saying, let us invade Judah, let us tear it apart and divide it amongst ourselves and make the son of, of Tabil king over it. Yet this is what the sovereign Lord says. It will not happen. It will not take place. 
For the head of Aram is Damascus, and the head of Damascus is only resin. Within 65 years, Ephraim will be too shattered to be a people. The head of Ephraim is Samaria, and the head of Samaria is only Ramallah's son. If you do not stand firm in your faith, you will not stand at all. As if he is saying to King Ahaz, Ahaz, look at me, look at me. I know it's tight. We both know that there are, there's a massive army that's trying to destroy you. But Ahaz, right now, right here, this is your defining moment. And you're being, going to be given a choice between faith or fear. And I'm here to tell you that the God of, of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, your God, wants you to choose faith. So Ahaz hears all this. And then he, he says this in, in verse 10. So, again, the Lord spoke to Ahaz, ask the Lord for a sign, whether in the deepest depths or in the highest heights. In other words, so, uh, so Isaiah says, I, God knows that this is a lot. God knows he's asking you to trust him with a lot. So ask him for anything. He wants, he wants to prove to you that he's here with you. He wants to prove it. So ask him for a sign. Then Ahaz says this, I will not ask. I will not put the Lord to the test. Now, that sounds real spiritual, doesn't it? Yeah. Because we heard Jesus say something a little bit like that. You know, Deuteronomy 6, there's one of those verses that says, don't put the Lord God to your test, to the test like you did in Manasseh, or sorry, Massa. You know, referring to this story where the Israelites were making these demands on God to prove that he was there with them. You know, because there are tests that we put God to that are just, if we're honest, they're, they're just silly, just silly tests. Dear God, if you do this for me, I will believe in you. You know, when really what we're asking for is we're, we're trying to manipulate God. It's, it's kind of like, a, like a, a child going to their parents and they say, Mom and Dad, this Christmas, I want an Xbox 360. And these three games, I've written them out for you. And if you give it to me, I will believe that I have parents. <laughs> You're like, wow, that's nice, kid. <laughs> I mean, we, we, but we do those kind of tests with God. Like, God, I will believe in you. If you but, but he's already there. I mean, the, the real question isn't whether or not you believe in God, but whether you, whether you align your life to the reality that is God. Because God's there whether you believe in Him or not. I will believe in gravity if these three things happen. No, it's already there. It's already there. But there is a time when it's okay to ask God for a test. That time is when God says, ask me. Ask me. Ask me for a sign. I know what I'm asking you to do right now is very difficult for you. So ask me for a sign. Just a few years later, Ahaz's son, Hezekiah, will go through a similar kind of experience, and he'll choose differently. We'll come back to that later. But in this moment, Ahaz, he kind of, he kind of does this, this, this sort of pseudo-spiritual answer, I'm not going to ask God and, and the reason he does that is because, see, if, if he asks God for a sign and God shows up, then, then he's going to have to admit that God's really speaking to him. And he's going to have to admit that he really doesn't want to do what God is asking him to do because Ahaz already has a plan in mind. You know, Ahaz already has a political solution to the problem that, uh, that Isaiah is coming to him and saying, no, just be still, calm down, chill out. So after Ahaz's pseudo-spiritual answer, Isaiah replies, Hear now, you house of David. Is it not enough to try the patience of humans? Will you also try the patience of God also? Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. You didn't ask for a sign, but buddy, here's your sign. Here's your sign. The virgin, Alma, that's the Hebrew word, we're going to come back to that will conceive and give birth to a son and will call him Emmanuel. He will be eating curds and honey when he knows enough to reject the wrong and choose the right. 
For before the boy knows enough to reject the wrong and choose the right, the land of the two kings you dread will be laid waste. Okay, so here's what's going on there. Saying, Ahaz, you didn't ask for a sign, but here's your sign. Right now in your kingdom, right now, there, there is a baby getting ready to be born. And his mom is going to call him Emmanuel. And by the time that little boy is old enough to ride a bike, let's just kind of put it in modern vernacular, by the time that boy is old enough to ride a bike, by the time he's five or six, the very countries that you are so freaked out about right now will barely even exist. You're getting ready to sell out your entire faith for something that a few years from now will not even exist. And if you dare to look, Ahaz, if you dare to look in your kingdom, there is a boy being born right now with that name. That's your sign. So five years from now, six years from now, when those countries don't exist any longer, you're going to know that you sold out for nothing. That's your sign, Ahaz. That's your sign. Now, one of the slippery little interesting things about the Hebrew language is that Hebrew is a little bit like English. It can have multiple meanings at the same time. Like if you say, my car is really slick, you know, know, that could be like a good thing or it could mean you just need new tires. I mean, there's a lot of different things uh, one word can mean. The the word Alma is a little bit like that. So that could mean a virgin in the literal, you know, non-marital experience sort of um, sense. Or it could also just mean young woman. Now, it's interesting that as this passage is um, passed on through history, even to the time of Jesus, it always seems to maintain some element in it of literal virginity. But what it seems is happening at this point is in the immediate fulfillment of the prophecy. It's just another woman, just another baby, who happens to be named Emmanuel. And if Ahaz will have the courage to look. He'll find that baby. And he'll know that just a few years from now, these countries that he is so scared of, he is so worried about, will not even exist. He'll know that. God's word is true in the immediate, and God's word is true in the long-term fulfillment, in the distant as well. But in a nutshell, here's what I think Isaiah is saying to Ahaz. And and I think to a certain degree, this passage is saying to us as well, don't trade God's long-term promise for short-term security. Any fix you're looking for right now is going to be a short fix at best. So don't trade God's long-term promise for short-term security. Ahaz, this is your defining moment. If you do not stand firm in your faith, you will not stand at all. Now, because of passages like 2 Kings 16, we know what Ahaz does next. I mean, even though Isaiah has come to him and he, and he has warned him in the clearest of terms to not go forward with the treaty with Assyria that he's, he's thinking of. See, so what ends up happening is here the, uh, the nation of Israel and the nation of Aram, they go and they fight against the nation of Judah. They attack Jerusalem. 120,000 people die in the battle. Another 200,000 are captured and, and, and uh, at least for, for a while taken away from Judah. And Ahaz... In the midst of that battle, he makes an alliance with Assyria, thinking that this other superpower, as it comes in, it's, that it's going to take away all the problems, and yet it only adds to the challenges of the nation. Ahaz gives away his entire faith. And within a few short years, he, he's the one who's sacrificing his kids in an Assyrian temple. He's the one who sells out significant amounts of the gold in God's temple, gives it to the Assyrians as his peace offering, starts to remodel the temple so it looks more like an Assyrian temple. And 
And as you might expect, the Assyrian Empire turns on Judah and turns on Israel. It wipes away the nation of Aram. It wipes away the nation of Israel. And as we get to the close of King Ahaz's life, the nation of Judah is hanging on by a thread. And what he passes down to his kids, what he passes down to, to his son Hezekiah, who ends up becoming king after him, is, is just a shell of the nation that he inherited. And his, and his boy Hezekiah, who ends up being actually a very good king because he doesn't live into his father's habits and legacy, but, but, he, but he inherits this, you know, this horrible, horrible mess that his dad has left him. When you get to heaven one day, you'll have a chance to meet some of these Old Testament characters. Don't plan on meeting King Ahaz there. I could be wrong, but from everything that the Scriptures tell us, this is the person that, that, that I mean, God showed up in his moment. He gave him the warning. He, he, he told him to trust him, but Ahaz caved. He completely and totally caved. And his life because of this defining moment and that choice of fear over faith, that choice, his life was an almost total and complete failure. Amen. No. And if we ended the sermon right there, that'd be kind of a weird spot, wouldn't it? But, but that's, that's the warning of the Old Testament. And that was because God showed up. God showed up in the moment out of love for Ahaz. Showing him that there could have been a better way. He shows up for us as well in our defining moments, in our times of stress. If we're willing to have our eyes open, there will usually be a sign of some sort. Some sign of God's presence there. Some sign that, that he's with us. It's often not as dramatic as we'd like. But as we live as people on the, on the other side of the cross and of the resurrection, we're reminded that what we've been given by God isn't just a sign. We've been given something much, much, much better. We've been given a Savior. Because 700 years later, that prophecy that, that came to Ahaz, that telling him to, asking Ahaz to trust in this nearly impossible situation, that prophecy would be fulfilled in ways that Ahaz could have never imagined. I don't even know if, if Isaiah could even imagine it. Words so powerful. The virgin, not just a young woman, the virgin will conceive. And give birth to a son, who, and his name will be Emmanuel, which means God with us. And this little boy isn't just a little boy who has this really cool name that reminds us of God's presence. This is the little boy who is God incarnate. And in this moment, it's not just God showing up with good advice. It's God showing up and joining our humanity, joining our struggle, standing beside us. Dying on the cross for us, rising from the dead for us. God with us, not just a sign, but a Savior. So I need to ask you today, where are you waiting on God? The places in your life that feel unfulfilled. A lot of life, if we're honest, it's, it's a little bit like driving in the fog. Um, you just can't see very well. You know that one day the fog's going to lift. You know that one day things are going to be clear. And yet in the, in the moment, it, it's just hard to see. It's hard to know how things are going to turn out. It's hard to know if God's really there. So maybe it's as your heart breaks over a son or a daughter who's struggling in their faith or a grandchild. Maybe it's the midst of a chronic illness, chronic pain. Maybe it's the midst of an unresolved employment situation. I, I don't know. But the lesson of King Ahaz is 
is a lesson that for us as well. Be careful. Keep calm. Don't be afraid. Do not lose heart. Be careful. Keep calm. Don't be afraid. Do not lose heart. In the moment right now, you might not be able to see it really clearly, but God's there. If you look for it, there's probably these little signs along the way, little indicators that he's there. Hang on to those. Because it it might take five years, it might take 10 years, it might take 700 years. That's one of the things that's just annoying about God. He doesn't look at time the way that we do. Because God knew exactly what he was telling Isaiah, and it it would only be fulfilled 700 years later. After all this history and the, you know, all this, I mean, there's so much that's going to happen in those 700 years. And yet for God, it just seems like those words, they come as easily as just rearranging the books on a bookshelf. Oh, I think I'll put this book over here now. God doesn't look at time the same way we do. But the promise for us today is that as we trust him, as we, as we, we don't trade his long, God's long-term promises for the short-term fix, if we fix our eyes on the Lord, if we trust Jesus in every situation, that one day, because of the, of the promise that would be fulfilled in Jesus of God with us, the, the Savior who would die on the cross for you, the Savior who would rise from the dead for, for you, the same Savior who would say, behold, I'm, I'm, I'm going before you to prepare a place for you, that where I am, there you may also be. My Father's house has many rooms. The same Savior that one day will usher you into eternity. There will be a day where you'll look back on, on and, and I'll look back on the, on the stuff that in the moment just felt so difficult, felt so foggy, felt so unclear. And we'll look back on it and say, that was horrible. I'm glad it only lasted a little while. Life will look different a thousand years from now. 10,000 years from now, 100,000 years from now. So don't trade God's long-term promise for short-term security. Be careful, keep calm, and don't be afraid. Do not lose heart. Let's pray together. Lord, thank you that your promises are true. Thank you that your word just illustrates for us just how much is at stake in our trusting, in our clinging to faith rather than fear. And Lord, help us to choose you. Thank you that you are God with us, with us today and with us into the future. Thank you, God, that so often you, you give us signs, reminders that there, are, there are, are, are things in our life that remind us of your love and presence. Lord, help our eyes to be open to them. Help us to see how near you are, how loving you are, how good your plans are. And congregation, I just invite you, maybe it's under your breath, maybe it's by opening your hands up in front of God, but there, there are things in your life, I just know it, where you feel like you are waiting. You're waiting on God's answers. You're waiting on God's promise. You're, 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 you're waiting on the fulfillment of things that you know God is going to do in your life, but they just haven't happened yet. Would you just, would you just lay them before God under your breath, in silence, or maybe just whisper them out loud, but, but just give them to God. Lord, I want to trust you. Just open your hands to him. Open your heart to him. Lord, I want to trust you. Give me the strength that I need. Help me to trust you in the midst of the fog, in the midst of the waiting. Thank you that your promises for me 
will be fulfilled. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.